So, design the process, process the design. Um, it's a clever title with a little bit of wordplay um, that I can't take any credit for. That's all Jim Brennan. Um, but uh, really, what this talk could be called is clarity of process for the sake of better architecture. So, imagine a design process that privileges idea generation, design value, and criticality above all else. One that fosters an environment of creativity and where the best idea ultimately wins. With a commitment to process, that environment is possible. But what is process and how does it apply to architecture and design? Um, those are some conversations we've been having for a while. Uh, we kind of took a, an internal look into our own thoughts, thought processes, um, with the ultimate goal of being able to kind of clearly articulate and understand how designers should be thinking about design. So let's start by talking about what is a process. Um, generally, it can be understood as a series of steps that are meant to lead to a particular end. It's often uh, formalized and written down so that it can be rigorously followed. When we talk about a design process, it's better understood as a flexible framework for making decisions. Um, in a design process, results are not predetermined or predictable but they're also not volatile because a commitment to following a particular process should guarantee uh, or assure a level of quality at the end of it so that you don't lose track of uh, the important parts of a project. Ultimately, it's our belief that process determines quality. You can only improve what you're making by improving how you're making it. And that's why it's really, really important that you're critical of how you're designing. The only way that you can guarantee that you're going to end up uh, where you plan to end up in terms of quality is to pay really close attention to how you're getting there. Let's consider a few basic process models that are out there as we begin to get our heads around the idea of process. The, the captain's command of ready, aim, fire, the carpenter's adage of measure twice, cut once, and the, the R&D or manufacturing and sales components of uh, product development. These are all um, examples where we see a sequence of steps that are aimed at a, at a particular goal. They all deal with iteration and convergence in some way, and they all definitely hint at the ethos of a design process, which we really feel is this. It's not so much what you're designing, but how you're going about designing that. The reason that we do this is because we want to not only know what we're doing, but how we're doing it. We want to understand what we're doing so that we can improve it, all with the goal of becoming better designers. So architectural design is a bit unique in that it often doesn't have a very clear sense of process. And the industry as a whole is a little bit um, unselfcritical about this because most other industries have a very clear sense of process, and not just the ones that would come to mind, like a manufacturing facility or the military, uh, but also very unpredictable and creative fields like our own. Um, for example, we expect our athletes in between games to be in the film room studying themselves, studying why things happen, and studying how to get the outcomes that they want. Um, but how often are we this self-critical, and what would we be doing differently if we approached our day-to-day -day with that same uh, amount of self-criticality. I think it leads to a, uh, a really interesting question, uh, an important question, which is, is design a black box? And uh, I think that there's somehow this notion that uh, design is a little mysterious or that good design is irreducible. And it leads uh, to this idea that um, design can't be explained or examined. And you'd be forgiven for thinking this because some of our most prestigious firms in our field have that one person whom it seems all like design inspiration flows to and from. Um, but it's likely that's not how those firms actually function. And we would push back against this idea in general. Um, so if the answer to this question is no, that design is not a black box, well, then how is it done? And I think a, uh, a thing that always helps us put some framework around that answer is 
uh, this quote by the American painter Chuck Close. Um, he has this famous quote uh, that goes, I always thought that inspiration is for amateurs, but the rest of us just show up and get to work. And the less famous part of that quote is actually, you sign on to a process and see where it takes you. And if you're anything like us, then uh, that gives you a great sense of relief. It's very liberating because as a designer, you don't have to feel the pressure of being constantly innovative. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every day. And you're also not on the hook for waiting around for that next big idea to just hit you fully formed. Uh, there really is a structured way to move forward and to be creative. It really allows you to embrace the, uh, the agency that you have as a designer in the particular circumstance that you find yourself in. You know, we know that as architects, we often don't decide you know, what's getting built or where it's getting built or how much of it is getting built. Uh, but we are able to be opportunistic via a process that we're committed to and trust that that will allow us to maximize the potential um, for what we're working on. You know, there's a lot of unknowns out there in terms of, um, you know, budget, contractor, program type, client, and the only thing that we can really control is the quality of our architecture, uh, because that's driven by the quality of our process. So, how many of you have been in a situation kind of like this? Um, it's something that uh, we call design by crisis, and it's where. Uh, the team's uh, critical energy is only focused on the most recent problem that arises. And whether that's a difficult detail or a surprising bit of code or a, a thing that the client just called up and asked for out of the blue, um, really that's, it results in an environment that is chaotic and in a architectural solution that no one is very happy with. Um, we've been in situations like this, I imagine you've been in situations like this. Um, and it was really the impetus for us to be thinking about process in the first place um, because we think that a good process has a very stabilizing influence on the trajectory of a project and on the internal and external pressures um, that shape that project. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, a process that, that we've been using for a while and, and some of you guys have been using for a while. We think it provides a really good framework um, and a system of thought for providing a, a, a clear sort of trajectory or a line of progression as you go through a design problem. And it has four phases. There's uh, ideate, iterate, align, and document. The, the ideate phase is where um, well, we call it rapid concept generation in terms of creating as many ideas as possible. This is where you're trying to broaden the conversation, get as much out there as you can, and really anything goes in this phase. In the next phase, which is iterate, you're taking a few ideas from the ideate phase that have been successful based on project goals that you've set out uh, with, with the client and the other people on the team, and you're moving those forward. You're um, exploring their potential um, mutations and, and ways that they, they could continue to uh, be evolved. In the, in the aligned phase, this is really where you're building consensus around one idea to move forward. You're validating the direction with the client. And I think here you have to ask the question, okay, so how am I moving between, between phases in this, in this process? And, and the alignment phase really highlights the idea that you need some type of analysis to do that. So, so you're leveraging different types of tools and weighing them against their, or the options against their success in terms of the different criteria that you've set out. And so that helps you build that consensus. And the last phase is the document. And this is where things are, um, are fine-tuned and realized according to the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, necessities of a design practice like ours. We think that this process applies to really any scale of a design problem. And we know that, at least here at Gresham, we often work on designs that have multiple facets. So as we're, as we're thinking about them, we're simultaneously thinking you know, about site plan, massing, energy efficiency, operational um, flows, and things like that. And you know, it would be pretty easy to follow this process model if they all sort of fit nicely together and you know, none of them affected one another, brushed up against each other, and messed them up. And then you can just kind of consider it in a nice linear fashion. But we know that this isn't you know, anywhere close to the reality. 
in, in any project, decisions are needing to be made simultaneously and they affect other parts of the project. And so in a lot of ways it starts to get pretty messy and you begin to realize that, man, design's not even a linear thing. Um, it, sometimes it feels like things are swirling about and you're just trying to really like, get control of what's going on. And so it becomes really clear here that, that this interconnectedness has the potential to derail um, even the project team that has the, the best intentions. And so that's why a commitment to process is so important. So uh, this process in particular has a few maxims that we've learned just through trial and error. Um, the first one uh, is that reinvestigation is not a step backward. I think from the previous slide, you can see that uh, not only is it not a step backward, but sometimes reinvestigation is essential to fully realize the potential of a design idea. A second is that don't rush to architectural conclusions. Um, this is something that the architect uh, John Prince Ramos calls slow architecture. And really it's taking the time to think with your clients before commencing the traditional design process. Um, and it's our experience that we can reliably deliver products of greater clarity and quality. Um, that you want to, with your clients, identify the core questions that they face and then establish some shared positions where you can collectively evaluate the architectural proposals that would follow. So let's just jump right into this process uh, in particular, um, each one of the steps, and we will share with you some of the project examples that really helped us to solidify some of our, our ideas. Um, the first phase is ideate, or uh, rapid concept generation. And this is really where you're just expanding uh, the amount of design ideas under consideration. And it happens after you and the client have some sort of conversation about uh, and develop a consensus on what would be a successful design. Now, um, I think some of us know that the role of the architect uh, is historically shrinking and as we give up risk and responsibility. And so you can project into the future that the role of the architect will eventually be limited to just the creation and conveying of ideas. And as kind of unfortunate of a situation as that is, I think it serves to underscore exactly how important idea generation is to what we do. So um, in this phase, we rely really heavily on drawing and intuition. Um, we think that drawing is essential to thinking and that uh, drawing is a tool for discovery. So one thing that we use to kind of get those juices flowing um, are uh, drawing matrices. Uh, because I find that my first ideas um, are sometimes uncreative, and uh, that's because uh, our intuition is very good at giving us solutions that we've either seen or done before. Um, and so I find it very useful to uh, take a blank page and force myself to fill it with drawings, and that uh, forces me to get past my first uh, one or two ideas. Um, and I had a professor in school uh, who would say, uh, your first ideas are always bad. And he wasn't talking just to me. Uh, he was talking to everybody. Um, but he said, Chris, your first ideas are always bad. And uh, your second ideas are a little less bad, which I think uh, illustrates kind of this point uh, and the importance of drawing. So here's a project example um, of a healthcare client that we were doing a feasibility study for. Um, we wanted to test some of these ideas. So what we did is we just, we started by just drawing and drawing and drawing. And we took all of that and we just showed it to the client, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that did a few things that were sort of surprising to us. The first was that it really generated a level of trust. Um, they saw how much work we were doing and they saw that we were leaving no stone unturned. Um, and then secondly, it, I think it revealed a level of expertise that otherwise would have gone unnoticed if we had just shown maybe one or two ideas to the client, as we usually do. Um, and then finally, we found that when we bring the client along with us on the design journey, that design solutions that otherwise would have been very challenging to them um, become far more digestible. Uh, for example, option 10 is, uh, it, it performs really well. It did a lot of things that the client wants, um, in spite of the fact that it is a hospital that kind of looks like a potato. And potatoes are really in this year. 
<laughs> and the last thing we did was we made a, uh, a matrix that compared the uh, design parameters that we discussed with our client against each one of our options. And it became really apparent really quickly which ones performed and which ones did not. And the last thing I would add about this is that the ideas that did perform very well were some of the last ideas that we drew. This is another design matrix. Uh, we used this for a mixed-use project in Columbus. And what we thought was successful about, about this ideate phase is that we privileged the, the generation of ideas over the, the tool that was being used to generate them or uh, you know, convention in terms of what a standard residential tower should look like. So you can see we had some things we were joined by hand, some we were generating digitally, and some things that look quite unconventional. But by expanding the design space in this way, we were able to come up with three completely unique uh, schemes to move forward into the iterate phase. Uh, speaking of the iterate phase, it is the second phase in this design process. And here we're really talking about design mutation. So you'll have a, you know, three, four, or five ideas from the iterate phase, or from the ideate phase that you'll, you'll move in here and you'll say, okay, we want to explore these further. And really what you're talking about here is um, exploring parallel paths without thinking about them as false starts. So you, you want to allow yourself to take um, you know, several schemes a considerable way down the, down the path with the belief that you're going to learn from the differences and the similarities that arise between those things. So you're not thinking that you're wasting time by doing that, but you're actually you know, learning more about what's going to make a successful project. Let's talk again about that mixed-use project in Columbus. The, um, this GIF here really does a good job at highlighting the importance of uh, representation and communication within this phase as you weigh the, the differences between the, your different iterations. We took this GIF to a community design review board, and we used it to have a conversation with them about the design idea. Not so much the, the exact manifestation that was drawn in one of these three options, but just to have the idea about what would be a successful project for the client and for the, the community in this context. Here we were able to have a conversation about how does the idea scale to what it needs it to be. And we were just using some of our iterations to kind of get the conversation started. Funny enough, we, we, we showed them, as you can see, a, a two-level scheme, a three-level scheme, and a seven-level scheme. And at the, the end of the meeting, we had all decided that it was going to be a five-level scheme, um, which, which is kind of funny. But at the same time, the, uh, the project is now like very uniquely uh, formed to the needs of the community and the client. So uh, this GIF, uh, if it doesn't give you epilepsy, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> it's uh, a study we did for a medical office building. And the, the design idea we were investigating was a, a sort of brick top that housed all of the more private uh, exam room functions floating above a glass base where the public lobby space would be. And so I think this just serves to illustrate kind of our commitment to multiplicity and iteration in a design uh, process. So after you've done your ideating and your iterating, at some point you're going to need to build alignment around um, one set of ideas to, to move that forward and make it a reality. And so when you get to the, this phase for align, what really becomes important is the types of, uh, of analysis that you're doing to make your decisions. So you know, sometimes you're doing a, a sort of a simple level of analysis. You know, maybe it's a pros and con list or a um, like a, a matrix like we showed previously, but sometimes it could be something like computational analysis to understand how you know, eight or ten things are working against each other um, in, in various ways. This is an example of a, of a more simple type of analysis where a series of facade iterations were done and then a daylight analysis and a, and a solar heat gain analysis were run and it was just a straightforward way of saying you know, what is the most successful way, how can we move forward with a level of certainty in terms of how this is affecting this type or this part of the design. And here what you're seeing is a, is a more complex uh, computational model um, that was built using an algorithm to run 2,800 uh, design options simultaneously 
looking at about you know 15 variables at the same time, including you know massing, first cost, program ratios, things like that. And ultimately, we were sorting them and vetting them by the uh, monthly profitability that was uh, needed for the developers performing the work. So the last phase um, in this process is documentation. And this is really where you execute the design ideas that you arrived at um, in the align phase. And it's also not the fact that we are a professional organization who provides professional design services. And uh, documentation for now is uh, a part of what we do. Um, but moving on, um, we want to talk about some of the cultural outcomes that we believe and have seen um, be a part of adopting a process like this. Um, the first one is transparency. And uh, so by clearly establishing design goals, uh, you can ensure that your design team is all working on the same objective. Uh, one wrench that we often see is that um, misaligned priorities can often result in unproductive conversations even among team members, where two people who are working on the same design problem, and this often goes unnoticed, that they may be searching for design solutions that are inherently different. And so by establishing your design goals very early, you can really focus the critical energy of your design team. Uh, the second is transparency of design, and this directly generates client buy-in. Because when a client understands the design, um, then it demystifies the design process. Um, when a design responds to uh, you know, different site and climate restrictions and also to your client's aspirations, then those facets of the design become integral to the project. And uh, everyone on the design team will be far uh, less likely or less willing to uh, alter or move them at some point in the project. Another cultural outcome that we've seen arise out of a commitment to this type of process is what we refer to as a meritocracy. And really what we're talking about here is that the best idea wins. The best idea will be you know, what rises to the top no matter who it comes from. It could be an intern that's been here four weeks or a principal that's been here 40 years or a, a client that's doing their first building project. And this is possible because you know, you've established those goals at the beginning of the project. You, you took the time, you laid them out, you didn't rush to architectural conclusions, and so now when ideas are brought to the table at any point in the process, you can weigh them against those goals and not have them colored by someone's you know, perceived level of experience or, or expertise. A, uh, a project example of this type of meritocracy, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the work we've been doing with the Nashville Food Project. They are a nonprofit in town. Um, they're a fantastic organization who's committed to, to feeding the, the needy in our, in our community. And they cook thousands of meals a week and take them out on food trucks and serve them to people who need them. We were working on a new headquarters with them and you know, we took that time at the beginning, we talked about you know, what are the sort of the root principles of the project and, and one of them was that you know, the kitchen is really the, the heart of this operation, it has been since day one, and so under no circumstances do we want to compromise its, its functionality. And so as we began to develop this project, the, the design team here at Gresham had an idea of a light wheel kind of cutting through these two barn-like extrusions and creating a really dramatic effect in the double height uh, public space area, and we were really, really excited about that and had some great, uh, some great renderings and that we really loved. And uh, the, you know the people with the National Food Project were just a little less excited. They were excited, but a little less excited. And eventually, you know, they came to us and they said, "Hey guys, we feel like um, the way that the, that the kitchen function is working because the light well is cutting through right, you know, right in the middle of the project, that it's compromised a little bit." And uh, you know, do you remember the, those principles that we laid out at the beginning? We think maybe things need to be shifted. And so you know, we kind of had to look at each other and say, "You know what? You're right. Like this is what we said we were going to do at the beginning." when we were committed to the, uh, you know, to the project and when we were competing for the project. And so we had to say, you know what, you guys are right. You know, you've, never, you've never built a project before, but this is the best idea. And so we're gonna do it. And you know, we really believe that it's uh, made the project a lot more successful. And the, the last cultural outcome that we're gonna talk about as a result of this type of process is that it enables design agency. And really what we're talking about here is that Having that, that, that clear set of goals that everyone is working towards, 
it provides on-ramps for the types of critical conversations that you need to have uh, throughout the design process. So that if you're drawing something and you, and you start to realize, you know, maybe this doesn't work um, as well as it could. Maybe there's an, another way, you know, that we could do this to, to make it serve that, that goal better. Then, then there's a place, you know, you know how you can, you know how you can approach anyone on the design team to, uh, to say, you know, I think that we need to, to look at this and do something differently. And so really, um, it gives people um, the confidence that, that what they're saying will actually matter and be taken seriously. And it's building emotional and intellectual investment across the firm, which I think everyone would agree is only going to elevate the quality of work that we're able to do. OK, great. So let's say that you're just thrilled with everything that we've said up here today. Mm -hmm. And you want to know how to maybe design with a little more intentional process. Uh, we have a bit of shorthand that we use um, when talking about kind of the effects of adopting a process like this. Um, the first one is just draw more. Uh, expand the design space and spend the time to iterate. And because at a certain point, it just becomes a numbers game. If you look at enough ideas, you're, uh, you just increase your odds of stumbling across something that's really special. The second is think about what you've drawn and establish consensus on design value because it's not really about the drawing that you think is most beautiful or that you have some attachment to. It's about which ideas perform according to the requirements of the project. And then finally, share what you've drawn. Um, that's both client to architect or architect to client and uh, designer to designer because uh, oversharing, uh, we think, makes, ensures that every team member is uh, working as efficiently as they can. And then to visualize your performance, because visual, visualizing an idea for a client goes a long way towards um, proving uh, that idea to them. And I think you know, we would be uh, remiss if we didn't take a second to just say thank you to the people who were involved in this project, both formally and informally. You know, who listened to, to Chris and I rant over lunch or coffee over the past few years, but really provided some really critical uh, feedback to allow us to crystallize some of these ideas. So we owe you a great debt. We just want to say thanks. Thank you, Chris Reed, for thanks, presenting this topic. <laughs> you did a great job of uh, informing us of a very important topic. You know, the, the whole concept of the design, you think about our mission statement about adding value to our clients, I mean, it's right there aligned with that topic. Just remember, uh, for the audience, uh, this is in the showcase tent, so you can read up on that and continue the conversation. Um, either reach out to, to Reed Simran or Chris Hole or others on the team uh, and continue the conversation about design, uh, design the process and process of design.